Thank you very much. So let me start by talking about uh, mentioning two problems that you're all aware of. Uh, problem one in circuit complexity, we want to show explicit circuit size lower bounds for strong circuit classes. Problem number two, in proof complexity, you want to show proof size lower bounds again for strong proof systems. So, and perhaps the third hard question is, how are these two questions related? And this is uh, a theme that has been going on for the last 30 years or so, and we've had already quite some uh, mentioning of this here at our workshop. So in fact, uh, the very first talk, Russell, uh, after explaining the true mission of proof complexity, uh, started exactly with this, uh, with this connection between uh, circuit lower bounds and proof size lower bounds. And uh, here's some more footage. I'm not quite sure if you can see this. This was Ido yesterday uh, talking again. Uh, that this is uh, really open in the Boolean world, how you can make such a transfer between circuit lower bounds and proof size lower bounds, and then explaining how this works in the algebraic setting. And uh, maybe in one line, the purpose of my talk will be to convince you that in the QBF setting, this works in a very neat and nice way. We have a very clean transfer in both directions, in fact, between circuit lower bounds and proof size lower bounds. So what is this actually about? So here I've got another quote actually from a survey by uh, Paul and Tony from uh, about 20 years ago, but it's pretty much up to date. And I, uh, it's again on this correspondence between, I mean, at least to, uh, this regarding to this point, um, with, uh, between circuit classes and proof systems. And I'll just read the last line. In general, the intuition for this approach is that any tautology that needs to use in its proof some concept that is not representable in complexity class C will not be efficiently provable in C frame. But I mean, the important thing is this is just an intuition and we don't know how, this, how to make this work in, in the propositional domain. And maybe the last, uh, the last quotation, some of you might know that there's a proof complexity theme song and actually this also <laughs> features here. Low bounds for circuits play a role. Well, you know, this connection isn't well defined. <laughs> Okay, so what's the question exactly? Let me just restate it once more. So we have this general belief that there should be a formal connection between lower bounds for proof systems working on C circuits and lower bounds for the circuit class C. As I tried to say before, I mean, this isn't made formal yet, but just to be a more, bit more specific. So one example would be, we would, we would like to show a correspondence between lower bounds for P-poly, so unrestricted circuits, and extended Frege. Because extended Frege, Frege can be understood as a proof system where the lines are just P-poly. And uh, same for other com complexity classes where, for instance, AC0 mod P circuits, where we do have a circuit lower bound, and AC0 mod P Frege, where we don't have a circuit, where we don't have a proof size lower bound. And it was also mentioned before in this workshop that, I mean, we do have restricted settings where this transfer works. One is feasible interpolation, but here we talk about monotone circuits. So it's perhaps not so clear what this, how this relates to the solution. Works also for cutting planes. Uh, Edo talked a, a lot about this in the algebraic setting. So in this talk, we want to talk about uh, quantified formulas. So maybe just a slide or two on what, we are, what, what this actually is. So quantified Boolean formulas, QBF, we are looking at the complicated problems, P-space complete. Uh, and just to mention that in the last 20 years, there's been really extensive work in QBF solving. So it's a really emerging success story that we see there. I mean, paralleling what is done in SAT, but uh, we are looking at a more complex problem here. And then also there has been quite some proof complexity in the last decade or so. Uh, so the objects we will look at are fully quantified prenex formulas. So that means we have a we have prenex normal forms. You have a quantifier prefix, and then the matrix will typically be in CNF. And moreover, we want that all the variables appearing in the prefix uh, in, the, in the in the matrix are quantified in the prefix. So that means there aren't any free variables. So such QBFs must be either true or false. There isn't any other possibility. 
And in accordance with convention and proof complexity, we look at refutation calculi for false QBFs. So we will assume that the formulas are false and we want to refute them. Um, what is important here is to remember this game semantics that we know for QBFs. We can interpret it as a two player game between existential and universal player. And what they do is they play according to the prefix and set the variables to zero and one. And if the universal wins, the universal wins if a clause gets falsified and otherwise the existential wins. So just let's look at an example, perhaps let's take example from the last slide. Here the existential has to start and maybe he sets X equal one. Well, then the matrix simplifies. Now U has its turn. And I mean, okay, if you look at what's left, it would be reasonable for you to also play one. Uh, and then no matter what the existential is doing, you falsify a clause to the, to the universal player has one. I mean, this is not a full strategy, but you can make it into a strategy and the formula is indeed false. Okay, so the, the universal player has a winning strategy on false formulas. And now, of course, we need some proof systems. Uh, and one of the core proof systems is uh, QBF, and QBF is again resolution. It's quite similar to what we know from the propositional domain. Uh, this is actually also one of the oldest systems in the area. It goes back to the 90s. And in a nutshell, it's just propositional resolution plus a new rule called <laughs> universal reduction. So resolution, we all know. We have some side condition here that C or D must not be tautological, but I mean, we can, we, we don't need to worry about that for the moment. So this is uh, the classical resolution rule. And we couple this with a new rule that can eliminate some universal variables. So you've got a clause here containing a universal variable U or literal, and you can drop U and simplify this to C provided that C does not contain variables right of U in the quantifier prefix. So in other words, nothing in this clause C depends on U. All the variables in C come left of, of U. Yeah? I mean, if you look at the game semantics, you can immediately convince yourself that this is actually sound because uh, the universal player, once he reaches his turn to, to set U to a value, you, I mean, he, he would in this case obviously set U to zero. And that means dropping the U. Here's a simple example. Suppose this is your formula and you want to refute it. It's a false formula. You want to refute it in a QU resolution. So you do a resolution step on X here. <coughs> then you've got a unit clause U, which by this universal reduction, you can just drop the U and get to the empty clause, thereby demonstrating that this formula is false. Okay, now. It's a, it, it's a nice but not really difficult observation that this can be generalized to all proof systems that we are almost all proof systems that we know in the propositional context, for which I want to define a general universal reduction rule. We work again with prenex uh, QBFs as before. And now let FXU be a propositional line in a refutation of, of phi. So it's any propositional line. If you're on cutting planes and inequality, if you're on Frege, it's a formula, whatever your proof system works with. Um, and now I'm adding two rules to this, or one rule to the system, which is again this universal reduction rule. Uh, and the condition is, as before, that U is universal with innermost quantification level in F. So, in other words, again, Nothing in F, none of the X variables will depend on U. And in this case, again, I'm free. It's sound to, for the universal player to either set U equal zero and therefore simplify the formula or to set U equal one. That's fine. Okay, and now it's, it's, it's really not, not difficult to see that if you start with any natural line-based propositional proof system, like resolution, cutting planes, uh, polynomial calculus, Frege, you can just add this one rule and get a sound and complete QBF system, which I will be noted by, by QP for this talk. Yeah? So QP is sound and complete for QBF. And if you plug in P equal resolution, this is exactly the system QU resolution that I've defined on the previous slide. 
Okay, so what I want to concentrate here for the remainder of this talk is on Frege systems. So, okay, we know already these are use axiom uh, schemes and rules. And uh, in fact, we've got a hierarchy of Frege systems parameterized by the circuit classes that you use as lines. Yeah, you can understand all these uh, Frege systems as working with circuits as lines. For instance, AC0 mod it is AC0 Frege is bounded depth Frege, AC0 mod P Frege, you use bounded depth Frege with mod P counting gates for primes P, TC0 Frege, you use threshold gates in the circuits. Um, so here you've got the simulation order of the systems. I mean, we've seen that also before. Um, we've got resolution, bounded depth Frege, AC0 mod P, TC0, uh, NC1, which is then Frege, and extended Frege, which is P-poly. And the current line of uh, where we can show hard formulas is this red line, and you see AC0 mod P is the strongest system for which we have lower bounds, and for AC0 mod P and above, we don't have anything. Okay, so now we want to look at these systems. So all these systems you can transfer into QBF by just adding this one universal reduction rule, as I said before. So we have exactly these same systems. We want to analyze them now in the QBF context. Um, so one observation is that propositional hardness immediately transfers to this setting. Uh, if you have a formula phi, which is hard for P, then if you just existentially quantify it, it will be hard for QP for trivial reasons, yeah? because uh, there aren't any universal uh, variables here. So you can't use universal reduction. The only thing you can use is rules from P and then you immediately transfer any of the lower bounds. But this is perhaps not really what we are interested in. Um, if you want to understand genuine QBF hardness in the sense that you want to see where actually, the hard, where actually quantification makes formulas hard that are not otherwise hard, what you could do is for the systems that I defined, you could just count the number of for all reduction steps, but you can actually also model this somewhat more nicely by uh, allowing NPO regles in, in the proofs. And let me just show you this. I define the system QP with an NPO regle, and the rules are, I mean, as before, the rules of the propositional system P, the universal reduction rule, plus I now use these strong entailment steps where the C's are any clauses, for instance, or formulas that you have, and you can derive a new line D whenever the C semantically entail, this is just propositional, yeah? propositionally entail D. And then for instance, in pigeonhole principle, uh, you would be able to infer the empty clause just in one step, yeah? because you can take all the axioms and get the empty clause immediately. Okay, so this isn't formally a Kugrekov proof system anymore. You need these NP oracles to verify the correctness of proofs, but we are just interested in showing lower bounds. So, I mean, even better if we can show lower bounds for these strong systems. Um, and yeah, okay, I mentioned already that we collapse this propositional hardness because we can now arbitrary propositional derivations, you just do it in one step. And it's also similar to what's happening in solving in some settings because there also you use subcalls a lot. Okay, so as mentioned, these systems eliminate propositional hardness. And now the question is, what will be hard in these systems? That's what we want to understand. And the answer is exactly circuit complexity hardness. Yeah. So what remains hard for these systems, once you filter away the propositional hardness is exactly circuit lower bounds. Okay, and here um, you've got a result that makes this more precise. And this is a precise characterization. So we have, we now want to, to know whether there are hard formulas in Q Frege. And we can say that this, such formulas exist. So we have super polynomial lower bounds for Q Frege if and only if there exists either lower bounds for propositional Frege or there exists lower bounds for non-uniform NC1, because these are the lines that Frege works with. And more precisely, the condition is that P space shouldn't be contained in non-uniform NC1. And this is, a, this, is a, this is an if and only if. Yeah? So 
I mean, this is the central problem in proof complexity. This is one of the central problems in circuit complexity. And the all of these two is exactly the question whether we have lower bounds for Q Frege in the quantified setting. And if you use these NP oracles that I defined on the last slide, you can formulate this alternatively uh, for this system Q Frege with an NP oracle. And then, of course, you lose the first case. So the first case disappears because that can't happen anymore. So then you get in a precise equivalence. You have super polynomial lower bounds for this system if and only if P space is not an NC1. And I mean, this just doesn't work for Frege, but it works for all the Frege system that I, that I defined before. So you can use also extended Frege, then this is equivalent to lower bounds for P poly, uh, and it works for all the usual Frege systems that I mentioned previously. Um, okay, so maybe just, just a word on how, how this actually works. So what, what, what happens? Um, the heart of this is by is, is this paradigm of strategy extraction, which is really unique for QBF, and you don't have a propositional analog of this. So what is strategy extraction that uh, corresponds to this two-player game I defined before? Whenever you have a false formula, there must be a winning strategy from the, for the universal player. And now what we can do for these systems is we can actually form a proof extract a winning strategy for the universal player. So we start with a proof and from the proof, we extract the winning strategy. And in fact, it is also used in solving to certify answers. So it's similar to what Jakob ta uh, talked about in the, mo in the morning. Um, and it turns out that the model in which you can do this strategy extraction is a simple computational model called decision lists. And I define C, de C decision lists here. So what is this? Decision lists are a bunch of if-then statements. You have a condition that you evaluate. And uh, in this case, the condition is a circuit in variables x1 to xn and circuit in the class C. And if this evaluates to one, then you set a variable u to a value b1, where b1 is either zero or one. And if this condition <laughs> didn't hold, then you go to the next line and so on. And otherwise, you have a case where you set u to cl plus one. So it's a very simple computational model, which actually originates from machine learning in the, in the 80s. And what we can show is that our Frege systems have strategy extraction in precisely this model in C decision lists. And this means that from a refutation pi of a formula, so let's say x are the existential variables of the formula, u are the universal variables, we can extract in polynomial time a collection of C decision lists, computing a winning strategy on the universal variables. So for each universal variable, you get a decision list that computes exactly the value of the counter strategy, depending on the inputs X, which the existential player sets. Right. Okay, and then it's not, I mean, once you have such a decision list, it's not actually hard to turn this into a circuit so the, here the conditions were circuit, but you can turn this into one single circuit, um, which where the depth increases by two. Yeah. So, and what this means is that if you look at depth D Frege, for instance, you have strategy extraction with circuits of steps D plus two. But if you have AC zero, then this plus two doesn't matter and you get strategy extraction in AC zero, likewise for AC zero mod P and the other classes. Yeah, so we have a strategy extraction more or less exactly in the computational paradigm on which the lines live. Okay, and uh, now we can immediately uh, exploit this for lower bounds. Uh, and for this, we just need to code some functions into QBFs, and we can do this very simply, in fact. So let f be any Boolean function, total Boolean function on the variables x. I define a QBF, call it QF, which is saying there is an input X such that for all Z, Z is different from F. In other words, this just means that there is an input such that FX is undefined. I mean, this is, this is clearly a contradiction if this was a total function. Yeah. 
And you can express this, I mean, you, you can, and you have the circuit, uh, if you have a circuit that, com that computes F, say in P poly, then you can simply use auxiliary variables to describe the computation and write down this into a CNF formula. So it's a sigma three formula, um, but the crucial thing is that the only winning strategy for the universal player is to play Z equal F of X. No, the only way he can win on this formula is by playing Z equal F of X. There's only one universal variable and that's the only thing he can do to, to win. So a strategy construction has to compute F. That's the crucial observation here. And now you can put this uh, into lower bounds immediately. So let's say you start with, uh, I mean, just for the simplest case, you, you have a fu function for hard for depth three of which we have many. This will be hard for Q resolution. Yeah. Why? You start with a refutation of QF and QRS. By strategy extraction, we know we can get a decision list. We know that this decision list is, can be translated into depth three. Uh, F was hard for depth three, hence pi must have been long. Yeah. So this is very simple. And exactly the same strategy you can use now for all the other uh, examples. And you see that we, I mean, by this recipe, we get really strong lower bounds in this setting. For instance, we can, we can take the, the circuit uh, lower bound for parity that's known for AC0 mod P. And as a corollary, we, we uh, immediately get uh, the circuit, the, the Frege lower bounds for QBF for AC0 mod P Frege, yeah? Which we don't have in the, in the propositional setting. Or we could use the uh, hardness of the mod formula, mod Q formulas for AC0 mod P circuits where P and Q are different primes. And then if we represent these correctly, then we can show this is actually that, that AC0 mod P and AC0 mod uh, Q frege are incomparable for different P's and Q's. Yeah? Because they will be hard for AC0 mod P, but will be easy for AC0 mod Q. Uh, and particularly this means that AC0 mod P will be exponentially weaker than TC0 frege, which again, we don't have in the propositional domain. Or you can use separations between the different depths. So for instance, we know that these SIPSA functions, they uh, separate depths D minus one from depths D circuits. You can plug this in again, but here you get this, I mean, this addition of plus two when we did this translation of decision lists into circuit. So the, so the gap uh, widens a bit and you get, a, uh, you get a gap of three. So these Q SIPSA functions will be hard for depths D minus three Frege, but easy for depths D Frege. And what's nice here is that this is actually a quantified CNF so the separation doesn't depend on the depths of the formula. Again, this is something we don't have in the propositional world. Okay, so um, what this picture shows is propositionally, we don't know how to exploit lower bounds for AC0 mod P, but in QBF, we can match exactly any kind of progress that we have in, in the circuit world by the strategy extraction uh, mechanism. Yeah? Okay, so maybe in the last five minutes or so, uh, let me uh, say what happens for resolution because that, that case is somehow a bit different. Question is, can we characterize QBF resolution also by circuit complexity? Uh, and this is particularly interesting because resolution corresponds quite a bit to solving. Uh, Benjamin will actually talk about this in the afternoon. And the answer is yes, we can do this. Uh, it's again a decision list model, but we need to adapt it slightly. Uh, and this actually has nice consequence because as a sort of byproduct, we get a size width result. I mean, uh, similar to the size width result that you know for positional resolution, but a different formula actually. We get this as a corollary to this characterization. Okay, so what's the circuit model here? Again, it's a generalization of this decision list model, which, is, which I mentioned goes back to the 80s. Uh, but now we have to generalize it to multi-output decision lists. Before we were always computing just one variable, 
now we have to compute it, have to compute multiple outputs. I mean, but it's really straightforward. Yeah. So we have input variables x1 to x uh, n. These are the existential variables, and we have output variables u1 to u m. These are the universals. Otherwise, my list looks exactly as before. Yeah. I have here terms on the x variables, and the b's are total assignments to the u variables. And we call this a unified decision list because, in a sense, this unifies all these single output decision lists that we had before. Okay, and what turns out is that this precisely again characterizes Q resolution uh, in the following sense that if you have a false QBF uh, of we need bounded quantifier complexity, that's a, that's a restriction, um, then the size of the smallest Q res refutation in an N, under an NP oracle again is polynomially related to the size of the smallest UDL. Yeah. So up to, to a polynomial factor, UDL size, which you can understand as a circuit uh, measure, will be equivalent to resolution size for bounded depths formulas. Uh, and you can, I mean, if you don't like this NP oracle, you can again formulate it differently and say, uh, if you have a form a sequence phi of bounded quantification, this is hard for QRS if and only if this requires large UDLs, or there is some propositional resolution uh, hardness inside, which in fact you can uh, precisely pinpoint. Yeah. Okay, so just to compare to the previous results uh, where we had this characterization for Frege. And the hardness was exactly, the, the, the circuit classes were exactly the lines that the system operates with. Yeah. Q Frege uh, working with lines from C was characterized exactly by hardness for C circuits. This is now a bit different because in resolution, we obviously work with C and F, so you can think of depth two circuits perhaps. Uh, and the complexity, intriguingly, the complexity of decision lists and hence also our UDL model is known to be strictly intermediate between depths two and depths three circuits. That's a result by Krause. So it's so somehow there isn't this tight correspondence anymore between what the line, what the complexity of the lines is, and what the complexity of the circuit model is. Yeah, if you translate these UDLs into on the depth circuits, you strictly are between depths two and depths three. Yeah. So that means the characterization to so the circuit model is slightly stronger than what the proof system uses. Okay, so I have, uh, well, just, just a bit on the proof. One direction is again strategy extraction that I explained before. Here you go from proofs to circuits. Uh, you have to combine these strategies into one UDL, and this is where you get a blow up. This is what depends on the quantifier complexity. Uh, and for the other direction, you basically intuitively, you prove that the strategy extraction is correct. So you, so you, in your proof, you somehow show that the strategy you extracted plus the algorithm is sound. Yeah, this you can prove in resolution. And this is also what you do in the Frege systems. All right, so let me just uh, conclude. What I try to show today is uh, that uh, this puzzle between how circuit complexity corresponds to proof complexity really has a very neat and tight answer in the uh, quantified setting. Uh, it works for these Frege systems, it works for QBF resolution. Uh, and I mean, I didn't really demonstrate this, but it really allows to very nicely and very simply prove many lower bounds, yeah, also for resolution. Uh, it would be nice to, I mean, get the full characterization for resolution where you don't necessarily work with unbounded QBFs, but the UDLs we've got at the moment, they are probably too weak, so they don't, they're not the right model. Uh, it would be also very nice to do a similar characterization for proof systems that actually correspond to actual uh, solving, so the, so the methods that are used in QBF solving. And uh, yeah, also other theoretical systems like cutting planes, polynomial calculus. It's not completely clear what, how what this uh, characterization would look like. Thank you very much. 
questions. What would you have to change if you wanted to capture some fixed fragment of the polynomial hierarchy? The universal deduction rule doesn't seem to specialize to a particular fragment. No, you can simply, I mean, you, you, you would restrict your formulas to be of bounded, uh, of, 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 bounded. Of, of bounded complexity. And all the formulas you would work with would also be of the bounded complexity. So if you want to have the case level, then you would just work with sigma k formulas. Right. That's perfectly fine. You can you you, you, can, you can do that. Yeah, that, that would work as be, as before. And the extension list does the length of the list play a role in that case? Or? Yeah. So in, in in the resolution case, uh, it, the the when you do the transformation, so it is one direction. Then we trans when we start from the proof and extract the winning strategy, which we compute in these UDLs. Then what we technically do is we first construct a single output decision list. That's easy. We get, I mean, these are linear in the size of the of the proof. But when we want to combine them into one UDL, into one combined list, which we need to do because otherwise this model is not the right one, uh, then we get an explosion. And that depends on the quantifier complexity. So if you have quantifier alternations, D quantifier alternations, then we get a UDL of size N to the D. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the last regarding the last slide, uh, you said that there are like uh, system corresponding to QBF solver. Do you mean that like, or can you make an, a quick example of what is a, a something that solver do that is not uh, like this uh, for universal reduction? Right. So in fact, I mean Benjamin will talk more about this in the afternoon. But um, what QCDCL solving, for instance, so that's the lifting of CDCL to the quantified paradigm. So what they use, you, you again can extract uh, proofs from QCDCL in some uh, QBF resolution system, but it's a more powerful system than the QBF resolution system that I showed you. So it uses some additional, I mean, in this QBF system, I was somewhat mysteriously saying um, that, uh, You have this condition that uh, whatever you derive in resolution must not be a tautology. Yeah, I mean, if it was an existential tautology, it would be completely fine. But if you derive universal tautology and then couple it with universal deduction, that might lead to problems. But sometimes you want to do this in solving, so you have a, a system which is more powerful, actually, actually exponentially more powerful, which is called long distance resolution. And for long distance resolution, for instance, we don't have such a nice characterization. So that would be really nice because then we would kind of characterize by a circuit model what's going on in QCDCL solving, for example. Any more questions? Okay, that's time for the